St. Jean Hospital I was telling you about is actually now owned by a microbrewery. Uh, oh, make, wow. Making like craft beers. Um, and then... Uh, so that's the, why you picked the site. Because you yeah, know you exactly. can yeah, yeah, get, yeah. get a pint after. Well, there's a saying in commercial archaeology here in the UK, which is like, you've got a trowel in your left hand and a pint in the right. <laughs> that's, that's the same in the United States. Yeah. I, don't think the, I don't think the bars and the pubs here give us an actual pint. They give us less no. than that. <laughs> less than that. You know? Fake like, pint. We can... Welcome, everyone, to Archaeology Arcade, the online program of the Florida Public Archaeology Network. I'm Mike. I'm based out of our office uh, and coordinating center in Pensacola, Florida. And joining me once again is my co-host, Tristan, out of Tallahassee. Tristan, how are you doing? Good. I've got tea in hand and ready to show you my military prowess or lack thereof. I, that's very appropriate that you have tea on hand right now because we have, uh, I believe, our first international guest with us today is archaeologist Henry Raymond Picard with uh, Waterloo Uncovered. Henry, how are you doing? I'm doing so well. Thank you so much for having me today. Absolutely. Yeah, we're super happy to have you on today to play this game. Uh, Napo Total War, Napoleon. I'm going to go ahead really quickly and read off the description of this game. Uh, this is from Steam, uh, which is a Steam website uh, where you can find the demo, which is what we are going to play today. It says, complete your Total War collection with this definitive edition of Total War Napoleon which includes all the downloadable content and feature updates since the game's release, which this game was released uh, way back in 2010, but, and its developer was Creative Assembly. Uh, its publisher is Sega. Um, take on the Peninsular campaign based on the intense conflict that raged over the Spanish Peninsula between 1811 and 1814. Choose one of three nations at war, France, Great Britain, and, or Spain, and lead your campaign across an independent map fe featuring 32 new controllable regions. Turn the tide of war with the Coalition Battle Pact, which introduces the Battle of Friedland, the pivotal moment when Napoleon crushed Russia's attempt to contain him. Wow. How, you know, these things haven't changed a lot. You know, they <laughs> still having problems. Build an unstoppable force with heroes of the Napoleonic Wars and the Imperial Eagle Pact, which together add over 20 legendary and elite new games. The Total War Napoleon Definitive Edition offers hundreds and hundreds of hours of absorbing gameplay. So there's there's a ton of, of content on this game. We're just doing the, the demo for this one. Um, Tristan, do you have anything to add to that about what we're going to do? Uh, no, we've got only one battle we're going to cover, one that's available. So we're going to do the Battle of Ligny, which occurred right before Waterloo. Water And, and yeah, so um, also I want to mention that if, uh, for those of you who are joining us live on Twitch right now, um, if you want to give us any comments or if you have any questions, go ahead and use that stream chat feature. Uh, it's always great to get some interaction. Um, all right. So, Henry, can you tell us a little bit about, about yourself? Like, where are you from? How'd you get into archaeology? Sure. So, um, my name is Henry Raymond Pickard, and I grew up in London, in England, and in Essex, which is the county sort of next along to the east, um, which is my, which is famous for having people with bad uh, fake tan. Uh, and that's about it. But also it has amazing archaeology and amazing history, um, which often hasn't been researched uh, very heavily because um, it's quite difficult to dig here. Uh, but yeah, I got interested in archaeology because there was a Viking battle that took place at the nearest town to me, uh, which is a place called Malden, which is where lots of fancy salt comes from. Uh, you'll see it on all those sort of cooking shows in the little white box. Um, and yeah, I, en I ended up uh, sort of being uh, obsessed with the Vikings and the Saxons and how uh, sort of England came to be created. And from that, that led to archaeology. Um, and I studied at the University of Reading, uh, which is outside of London, but the opposite way, west, um, and studied in Denmark to uh, get more acquainted with Vikings, uh, their religion, their archaeology, or I should say the Norse culture. Um, and yeah, uh, then I've been working as an archaeologist here in the UK on various building sites around the country. And I just recently started with a charity um, called Waterloo Uncovered, which also is the leading 
institution doing excavations at the site of the Battle of Waterloo, which you can do on the full version of this game, I believe. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, that's yeah, that's really why we wanted to have you on is because of Waterloo Uncovered. Uh, but of course, with your background with Vikings, we were talking earlier before we went live. We'd love to, we, we want to have you back for some other Viking games. There's yeah, quite a sure. few. Of them. So, can you tell me a little bit of more about Waterloo Uncovered? What you said it's a charity. What what do they what do they do? Of course. So, um, Waterloo Uncovered was founded in 2015 by uh, two guys called Mark and Charlie who had served in the British Army in Afghanistan and Iraq. Um, and they came back after quite a tough service and Mark had suffered from, uh, had developed post-traumatic stress disorder. Um, and he had studied archaeology with, um, with Charlie and, uh, went back into the archaeological industry and found that it was helpful with his recovery from post-traumatic stress disorder. And so he decided to set up the charity so that other, uh, we call them VSMPs, so veteran and serving military personnel, um, could, could access the same benefits of archaeology. And so the charity has been sort of, um, since then, dedicated to the idea that archaeology can not only be this very fascinating topic, but also a therapy for people who, um, you know, who are suffering. Uh, you know, there's a, it's an amazingly unique charity because it draws this sort of continuity between the soldiers of today and yeah. the soldiers of the past. And quite a lot of the be beneficiaries who come with us to the excavation are part of units that took part in the battle 200 years earlier. Yeah. Uh, th that's incredible. Yeah. I know there's a, there's a group called task force dagger in the United States and they, they do similar. They, they, um, they don't excavate one particular battlefield. I think they're, they're mainly going out and uh, recovering service members that were lost in previous conflicts, but um, mm. but yeah, I think that's, that's a great, that's great way to get veterans involved and, and giving yeah. purpose back and wait for them to give back. I think it's a fantastic. I'll add there's uh, another one in the U S too called American veteran archeological recovery. Yeah. Amazing. Yeah. 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 So, so tell us, oh, so, so what are the uncovered you, what, what is your staff like are you, these, obviously you're, you're working with veterans, mm. uh, but what, how many staff members do you have? And are these all archeologists or are they multidisciplinary? So we're a sort of mixed mixed bunch, but we're a very small team at, at the core. So we've got um, Mark, who has the military experience and the um, uh, archaeological experience as well. And the same with Charlie, who is one of the main trustees that we have of the charity. Um, and then there is Kate and myself, who are both from archaeological backgrounds. Um, and we both work as part of the fundraising team. Um, we then have various people who have done, um, who have either done archaeology with Waterloo Uncovered or little bits here and there uh, that help in our comms department and in our sort of administrative role. But for the meantime, uh, our sort of main core team is of six full time and two part time. Um, you know, mo as I say, most of us have some sort of background in archaeology or experience of it through the charity. Um, so if anyone has never been exposed to it, they do get exposed to it, um, as we go and excavate each summer, which is, which is so much fun for, uh, for them and for us to introduce them to it as well. Yeah, that's fantastic. And then just real quick, uh, I'm looking on the, um, the zoom one. It looks like with your share screen, I don't see it moving around like I do on the uh, Twitch feed. Just, just FYI. I don't know. Mar Mar uh, sorry, Henry, are you able to see? Uh, the the well, battlefield side, or do you see the map right now? Yeah, I just see the map at the moment. Yeah, same here. Yeah, great. Okay, so right. I'll let, that's all good. Yeah, I'll let Tristan because I see it on the, our Twitch right now. It's it's working fine, but right. it's just for uh, for us live because there's a little bit of a delay. Um, so I I do have a couple uh, comments in the stream chat. So I'll go ahead and uh, buttery barnacle says live archaeologists because dead archaeologists are archaeology, which is uh, I, guess, <laughs> I guess that's right. Uh, Barbara says she loves British history and archaeology. Uh, go Lester line lions. I guess she went there uh, for, I think for her MA. Uh, mm -hmm. And then she also says that uh, un Waterloo uncovered. She says, what a wonderful charity. So glad something like this exist. So, uh, so yeah, some, some great comments there. So, um, can you give us a little, okay, now I see it fine, Tristan. Yeah, same um, here. Good. Can, great. You, can you talk to us a little bit about, um, the, you know, the leading up to the, 
Battle of Waterloo or the Waterloo campaign. Can you give us a little bit of context for, for what we're about to see here? Of course. So we are talking about 1815 uh, at the moment. Uh, and this comes after the sort of height of the Napoleonic Wars has sort of cooled off a little bit. Napoleon has uh, been driven back from Russia uh, during the winter, this famously brutal and horrible um, failure of uh, invasion into Russia that gets steamrolled back, uh, much much like in the same way that you see with the Second World War with the Germans. Um, and he gets pushed all the way back to France and he is defeated, he is forced to surrender, and he is, um, he is banished to the island of Elba, which sits just off the North Italian coast. Um, and he stays there for about six months before, uh, and um, sorry, because this is at, at the time of the French Revolution, uh, the Allies, so the British, the uh, Russians, the Prussians, and the Spanish uh, decide to put the French monarchy back on, but that doesn't go very well. And there's all this um, uh, upheaval in France, and he makes a break for it, basically. Napoleon makes a break for it gets on a boat with his small contingent of men that are remaining uh, with him and goes to France. And the king of France orders that he be arrested. Uh, but instead, the men that go to arrest him end up joining his banner. And as he marches towards France, more and more people um, join him. And he ends up basically you know, performing a coup, effectively, mm. uh, a popular coup. Um, Unfortunately for Napoleon, part of the conditions of the peace uh, that led to his banishment were that he could never be the ruler of France again, basically. And so, interestingly, these allies immediately, who, who all happened to all be communicating in the, uh, something called the Vienna Accords, um, basically declared war on Napoleon, not on France, only on Napoleon. And oh, wow. they... So this entire campaign, Ligny that we're looking at now and Waterloo, for at least from you know the position of what the Allies were arguing, was not a war against France. It was a war to, def to get rid of Napoleon. Um, and this battle that you're looking at at the moment is the first engagement as Napoleon, for the first time ever in his military career, heavily, heavily outnumbered by Prussian, Belgian, German, and British forces all starting to converge on the French border. And this is his first, his sort of first move of the, of the chess piece, if you will, to mm -hmm. try and get a bit of stability along his front line. Okay. Yeah, no, that's, that's a great context. And so it looks like, so, I mean, this is basically just like a village. Is that what we're looking at? Essentially, they're just like, a village is where they're yeah, playing. yeah, yeah. So yeah. Ligny, Ligny was one of the major uh, crossings across. Um, oh God, I've completely forgotten what river it is, but it was one of the major crossings of the river along the French border. I think okay. the mm. and um, or at least the what the one that had the easiest access to um, to Paris. And so Napoleon's goal here, he was basically faced looking at out at this village. The Prussians were holding one crossing and the English and um, Prussians were converging a little further to, uh, and the rest of the Prussians were converging further to the north Okay, um, with uh, Belgians and Dutch, etc. And so he had to make a choice to basically divide and conquer. And he thought the first target to attack would be these Prussians who were at this major crossing by Paris. Um, and though, even though it was a, you know, little village, he, he, to him, he thought this was the most crucial thing to strike first, to push Blücher, who was the general in charge of these forces, back and gotcha. away from France to give him some breathing room. So he's, he's taking the initiative and hoping that, you know, he, he's successful. And so the, how far is this from, I know you uh, you said Waterloo Uncovered mostly does their excavations at the site of the Battle of Waterloo, but um, how far is this battle from Waterloo? Uh, so it's not too far at all in terms of its relation to, um, uh, I, I mean, it's just next door, really. The, 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 in terms of the map of this part of the conflict in the Napoleonic Wars, it's very sort of claustrophobic. 
Mm. You know, this is for Napoleon effectively just like a smothering campaign by these so these soldiers. And so Waterloo only happens, you know, uh, a couple dozen miles away. Um, you know, it's not very far away at all. Um, and so he is desperate, as I say, to split apart this force which is con- converging on him so that he can have a fighting chance at, um, you know, keeping his reign intact and keeping France at the, at the apex of its power. Right. And so I see that we obviously were on one side of the river and uh, Tristan, you are, you are Napoleon. I am right? Napoleon. France. And I zoomed in on actually Napoleon here. Yeah, I saw, I saw that. I thought that was him. It looks familiar. So there's a museum in Daytona beach in um, Florida called the museum of arts and sciences. And they, uh, they have a TikTok account. And if you go to their TikTok account, they actually have a, a death mask of Napoleon for some reason in their collection. I guess there's a lot of like Napoleon death mask for some reason. I don't know why. But um, all right. So do we want to go ahead and unpause and, and get the get this battle started? Sure. I'll get some orders going and, and uh, it's best to do that while it's paused. <laughs> right. Yeah, sure. And, and so, Henry, um, what... What kind of uh, work are you all doing at Waterloo uh, this year? You said the field school is coming up. Do, do you have any set plans or um, what, what are you guys doing? Well, currently we, we're looking uh, where this trip we're going on next week is to decide the areas that we will be approaching the Belgian government to give us permission to excavate. Um, we have some areas in mind. Um, in, in the past, we have done these very famous farmhouses that at the Battle of Waterloo were like slap bang in the middle of the French and English lines. Um, and so there was absolutely chaotic fighting happening around there. Um, and uh, so the, the names of those were La Hassant and Hugomont. Uh, and then we also have in previous years, uh, most recently 2019, excavated the Allied Field Hospital. So when I say allies, I mean the English Belgians, French, and some German states. They had a major field hospital um, on uh, an escarpment at a ridge um, called oh, it's something St James. I've forgotten its name now, but it's 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 basically called St James's Hospital in in French, St Jean, basically. Um, so we have been thinking about possibly revisiting some of those sites to look at other areas, um, and the newest one, which. Uh, definitely caught my attention when it was on the list is this town on the right wing of the French line during the Battle of Waterloo, which is called Plassenoir. And Plassenoir was this town where outnumbered French forces were trying to hold the right line so that Napoleon could keep his attention on the English who were directly in front of him. And it kept on changing hands between the Prussians and the French in apps in probably some of the most chaotic and brutal fighting of the battle. Um, and so we suspect, or at least I suspect that if we were to do any excavation in the area there, we would find, you know, very obvious remnants of this battle, musket balls, badges, various possessions that were dropped in the, um, chaos of mm-hmm. that interaction. Yeah. Um, yeah. And so you, you mentioned, uh, oh, sorry, but you, you mentioned that, um, you know, obviously this is taking place in Belgium is where you all were at. They had to get permission from the Belgian government. What is that process like? Because I know in the United States, uh, I think we have, you know, very different like laws in terms of um, cultural heritage protection. Can you kind of talk about uh, how, how that works in, in, you know, you all working with Belgium? Yeah. So um, we have a good dem- diplomatic relationship with um, the Belgian government and also with the county out there. So like the administrative area, which is called Walloon, um, which is also why Waterloo sounds sort of weirdly English is that it wasn't actually called Waterloo. It's called Vassalou. Oh, okay. Um, and the, you know, the English were just like Vassalou sounds like Waterloo. That's yeah, right. Yeah, we had that in the, a lot of places here in the U S too. Same yeah. thing. Um, and, and so we, uh, in previous years have sort of but by partnering with a professional archaeology um company here not not that we're not professional obviously but like we there are dedicated companies that focus on just the archaeology uh, whereas you know we focus on the archaeology and on veteran care um and well-being 
Um, and that is a company that's called LP Archaeology, which is based all, all around the UK, but I think they are based in London. Um, and we partner with them and get a uh, special permission to dig it basically from the angle that, you know, this, the, the Battle of Waterloo is a, uh, a, a key part of English uh, or British and I mean, uh, heritage um, in terms of our mil military history it is sort of one of the biggest ones for for the country and so I think they've managed uh, the Warsaw Uncovered and LP Archaeology have managed to hash out this special relationship with um, the Belgian government that allows us to revisit year on year and um, you know they they see it as a benefit and enriching the story of of their historical landscape yeah, absolutely. And so the the battle itself is is a lot of the land where it took place. Um, is it still, you know, is it owned by the Belgian government? Is it private landowners? How does how does that all work? So as far as I'm aware, there's this sort of central area around what is called the Lion's Mount, um, and there's a few other sort of central areas which are owned uh, around that and uh, central buildings. I mean, sorry, that are also owned by the Belgian government. Um, then beyond that, you're into sort of um, private landowners. So, for instance, um, the St. Jean Hospital I was telling you about is actually now owned by a microbrewery. Uh, oh, making, wow. Making like craft beers. Um, and then... Uh, so that's the, why you picked the site. Because you yeah, know you exactly. can yeah, yeah, get, yeah. get a pint after. Well, there's a saying in commercial archaeology here in the UK, which is like you've got a trowel in your left hand and a pint in the right. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's the same in the United States. Yeah. I, just, I don't think the I don't think the bars and the pubs here give us an actual pint. They give us less no. than that. <laughs> less than that, you know. Fake like, pint. Kind of, yeah, yeah, give us a fake pint. That's pretty much the same. Yeah. yeah. So, so when you all find uh, artifacts. Does do you have to then? Does this go to the lab and conservation, and then what ultimately happens to all the um, artifacts that you find? So uh, the majority of the objects, by which I mean pretty much all of them, unless they're not deemed worth the effort, because then you know it's just some scrap metal, metal or something, are given to um, LP Archaeology who uh, treat them, conserve them. Uh, and you know, do all the necessary steps to ensure that the degrading of the objects due to time, water, air, everything else that r ruins them um, is you know is stopped basically. Mm -hmm. um, and then the objects remain as a resource uh, for future study. Um, we have given them to English museums for uh, study beforehand, and we are currently developing um a better version of the online database we have of oh, our, great. our artifacts um which uh you know should help you know make this more the things that we do more accessible absolutely because we yeah. find some amazing things and yeah afterwards we use them as resources so often uh for instance i'm meeting a lot of people talking about what the charity does and it really and it really helps um especially if we're looking for support of what what we're doing as a charity, it really does help to have a physical object there for people to look at and uh, if, if sensibly done to handle as well. Um, and so, yeah, we, we keep them as a resource and we use them to help tell the story of the battle and of the charity. It's the short answer. That's, that's excellent. Yeah. I think a lot of people, you know, when they think of archeology, span it's just that, you know, they just think of the excavation, but you know, there's, there's a whole other side of, of conservation and then interpretation and then making these objects accessible for people that is also incredibly time consuming, but obviously like a really important component of, of, uh, of archeology span as a discipline. Um, I do have a couple of comments. Barbara says, uh, it is so interesting and different. And I have a hard time grasping the scale in regards to distance in Europe. Everything seems so close together compared to here in the States. Um, and then she also says beer and archaeology are international. <laughs> <That's Yes. laughs> and so, uh, Tristan, I, I see that, you know, the battle has commenced. It looks mm -hmm. like you're trying to cross this bridge. Uh, I guess the river is too, it's too deep, I guess, to just like, because it doesn't look that big of a river. Maybe it's, maybe it's too deep to actually just go across. Um, but we're seeing a lot of casualties. We're seeing lots of firing of muskets. We saw some artillery early on. Um, Henry, when you all find, are you able to tell based on um, 
musket balls or uh, or artillery that you all find, whether it was fired by the French or the Prussians or or the British, or is that something that you can tell archaeologically? We can, yeah. So um, each army had its own weapons that they used, and as a result, they made their own. Um, you know, they had special molds for making the musket balls. Some armies had the capacity to make them themselves with little, um, uh, like clamps that look a little bit like uh, two ice cream scoops put together. Um, and just through the sort, uh, at its simplest, the sort of difference in length in millimeters or whatever smaller than millimeters, I've, I've never had to use it. You know, they can tell the, di the, the difference between the French ones, the English ones, the Prussian ones. Um, and then um, other studies that are done uh, outside of the charity, but, you know, that help with us telling the story of who was where, when, um, the sort of makeup of the iron used in the musket balls or in the cannonballs um, uh, or the lead as well used that helps mm -hmm. us uh, work out, you know, based on um, industrial sites that have been found in the various countries these armies came from, we can work out who, who shot who, where. Wow. So, so it's basically like a gigantic crime scene almost. I mean, yeah, I think, yeah. It's, and then, so are you able to tell based on, you know, if you can find, you know, a you know particular musket ball, like this is British and then maybe this one's French. Are you able to tie, tie those into like lines of fire to, to figure out where units were at? Is that how you determine whether a regiment or a unit was was at a particular site or not? Yeah, to a, to a certain degree. So um, w probably the clearest story we have of something like that was to do with that field hospital I was telling you about, uh, St. Jean. Now that is on top of a escarpment, so a, a, a steep slope that the English chose to put themselves on so that musket balls, uh, sorry, cannonballs rather, would hit hit the... Uh, escarpment and either bounce over or just be eaten up by the ground. Um, and so this field hospital mm -hmm. was 600 meters behind the top of this hill. Now Napoleon never makes it that far up the hill uh, at this battle, but we find French cannonball, not French cannonball, sorry, French uh, pistol balls um, near the hospital. Oh, wow. um, and so we, through that, have managed to work out that there must have been a small contingent of French horsemen um, that managed to break through the English line and get all the way to the very rear of the battle. Like we're beyond like the line of British soldiers, you know, of organized forces. And we're now at a field hospital and they've turned up and started shooting at, you know, at somebody basically. Wow. Yeah. Um, and so that represents a very sort of brief moment um, of the battle. Uh, I suppose it gets a bit more tricky towards the center of the battlefield because, you know, the, the tide goes back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. Um, and I, I'm so sorry that I can't give you a definitive answer of whose shot this was. Oh, no, it's all good. I just, mm -hmm. you know, I, I think it's just so fascinating that, you know, you can piece these pieces together. Um, and and I, one thing that we just saw on, on this particular battle, which again, I believe this took place a couple of days. Was it just a few days or a day before the Battle of Waterloo? Yeah, two days, two days before Waterloo. So just two days. But we're seeing, you know, obviously Tristan's trying to get uh, across this this river through this bridge. Mm. But we saw a lot of fire coming from the building. And that's something that, you know, at least for me, when I think of these Napoleonic, you know, giant battles, uh, you know, I think of these big kind of empty spaces, like they just pick the field somewhere. But obviously that is not the case. I mean, they're using buildings for cover. Do you find that archaeologically, like at battlefields like this during the Napoleonic War, you know, building materials that obviously were were damaged from artillery or anything like that? Yeah, definitely. So at all of the sites I've mentioned bef beforehand, but especially at Hugomont and Place Noir, you can still see musket ball marks in, in the stones there um, wow. and, and damage. Uh, you know, in, in the worst case scenario, a lot of the places that came into this sort of to and fro battle were just completely burnt down. But of those stone parts that still remain, you can still today see the remnants of that battle there. And so, uh, you know, those in these particular cases that you're mentioning, these are obviously buildings that are still standing. Do we, do you know of any cases where these buildings just were completely destroyed by artillery? And are you able to locate those archeologically if, if that's the case? 
Yeah, so you you there will be a presence archaeologically. At the minimum, it will be some charcoal, you know, a high concentration of charcoal, um, indicating a very hot fire, basically. Or you know, if we're lucky, it will be um a you know, there will be rubble and hopefully r- rubble that has some marks in it that indicate how it came down, you know, like shatter marks showing um, you know, the pressure of a cannonball or you know, even just pistol balls. I can't. I can't think of any specific examples of of that that we have mm-hmm. dug up. But we've definitely been looking. Um, like Hugomont, for instance, has the highest sort sort of concentration of evidence regarding like the damage that that it, 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 it took because it right. caught fire repeatedly. Oh, um, wow. and bits were shattered and ended up all over the place. So you end up when you're excavating in those grounds, finding bits of masonry, bits of you know, wood and so on. And you wonder how did that get there? Well, it's still part of this old building that was just smashed to pieces by cannonballs as the French tried to dislodge the English. Yeah, that's, that's incredible. And then have, obviously, you know, this took place during the Napoleonic Wars, you know, you know, 18, in this particular case, 1815. I imagine there's quite a bit of historical documentation about that. How is that the case? Or, and even if so, how do you utilize that? Um, so yeah, we we rely a lot on those first hand accounts or second hand accounts uh, to help tell the story. So um, in a lot of the work that we did on on the field hospital, you know, a lot of the stuff that we found tied into the first hand accounts of people who were there, basically saying how awful it was to be there and what a shocking scene it was. Um, so the uh, with the field hospital, they mentioned. Uh, piles and piles and piles in each corner of this farm um, piles of human limbs basically that had been amputated wow. by, the, by the surgeon there um, and when we excavated in 2019 we uncovered three limbs that had not been removed or just you know buried wow. uh, last minute one of which still had a uh, musket ball lodged in it uh, that wow. in, a, in a leg bone yeah, and I don't imagine, you know, back in during that time period and when you get hit by one of these, you know, these musket balls are quite large compared to modern bullets that yeah. it doesn't, you know, it, it literally shatters the bone in some cases, right? So the only way to really save the limb was to to remove it. Um, yeah. um where you when you find these limbs, what's the protocol with that when you when human remains are discovered? There's there's a so I can't speak for the um what it's like in Belgium, but I imagine it'd be something quite similar to how we do it in the UK is it's, um, there's a high degree of protocol behind it. So as soon as you find human bones and you can recognize them as human, you have, it's basically you stop work Mm -hmm. and, uh, you stop work there and you inform the local authority. Now that would be an archeological authority, the police sometimes. Um, and also, um, uh, there's there's a um over there's like an organization in the uk i've forgotten its name now but they but they give special permission on behalf of the government to say yes you can excavate this gotcha. um, yeah and so and so the protocol for that would have been yeah approaching all of those parties mm-hmm. and um getting the permission needed. yeah yeah and i'm wondering too like you know with modern dna technology if if you're able to you know maybe cover dna from any human remains and connect it with an individual based on, you know, family, family lineages as well. Yeah. I know people have been doing that at, um, at previous battlefield sites. I, I remember hearing one about, um, a French soldier, um, bit them working out who was related to them 200 years later. That's um, incredible. I, I know that hasn't been done with the charity just because it's not within our, our, our sort of scope as sure. As so it would be incredible to do, but right. well, that is possible. You can find out a lot, a lot of things just from the odd bone. Sure. Um, so, so, for instance, there was a one piece of a mandible that was discovered by my university, Reading, um, when I was there, and it was uh, a Roman age, but it was found that this person had come from basically closer to China. They they had, you know, they they were there from from. The Far East, basically. Wow, that's amazing. Hadrian's Wall. So, 
you know, complete opposite end of the world. Yeah, yeah. I mean, we think globalization is new, but it is not. You know, people have been moving around forever. I did have uh, some, there's some comments in the chat. I have one comment um, asking about, we, we saw during the artillery in this battle that's taking place right now, that some of the horses uh, were, were, you know, casualties. And uh, she's asking, have you all found evidence of horses at the battlefield site? Um, yeah, we, we would have, uh, we have found evidence of horses there. I, I'm sure we would have uncovered some bones, but in the resources that I've had access to at the short time I've been with the charity so far, I haven't uh, been able to, um, to find out for myself, but we have found various objects associated with the cavalry. Um, the, these include sort of military patches, badges, straps, leather, all these kind of things. Um, there is this account also after the battle, which would explain why there might be, you know, a shortage of horse bones. <laughs> it's right. that you know, the time after this battle and the time beforehand when France is now facing war once again is a time of severe uncertainty for the civilian population. And so it would have been very likely, and it was not uncommon, that after a battle people might have come to, you know, save what they could to eat from oh yeah so yeah uh, that that is something that's quite funny about the site or or interesting about the site is that you know you for something so monumental you you know you find very few uh kind of precious finds because you know there was a lot of looting by other members of the armies um but then also by uh, the local population who wanted to come and see what was you know, what was up for grabs basically. Right. So, you know, you're mentioning these local populations. Do we know based on historical accounts, battles like either at Waterloo or this one, or even maybe earlier, were people like spectators? Were they just kind of watching what was happening from their houses? Were they, what do we know about that? There were definitely people who liked to spectate. We know, we know that people used to do that. Um, uh, so weird. In, to me. Uh, it is, it is so weird because people, you know, there, there were, there's always been this sort of idea of a, of a skirmisher in militaries, you know, all the way back from Alexander the Great. And it was the same with Napoleon. People s sent out in small groups all around the battlefields. And if you saw, you know, a general making a break for it or a messenger, you would try and intercept them and, and kill them. And so if you were a person just camped on top of a hill with your popcorn, you know, what you're putting yourself at risk, right. not only from the gunfire down below and all the various other awful stuff going on, but then you've got these people going around the outside of the battlefield, you know, looking to pick off anyone they can basically. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, it, it would have been incredibly risky and, you know, fair, fair play to them if they thought that was a good day out. Right. Yeah. I mean, I don't think I would have done that, but you know, I guess back then I, you know, what, choice maybe people had was very different but um and then speaking of calvary i mean again when i when i think of calvary you know i think medieval uh so it's interesting that they're still using calvary with with muskets or artillery C can you talk a little bit about how that you know we're seeing it used right now i mean how how was calvary used during this period of time so cavalry was used to basically decimate um infantry lines as the one you see now the prussian sort of falling falling back there you know if you started um if you drove these hundreds of horses each group had hundreds to thousands of horses at this group of people who are forming a roadblock for you you go in there and the horses plow through them um and then as they're broken up you on your horse hard to reach with a very, very long and sharp sword, start slashing away at people, basically, mm -hmm. um, and just completely uh, pulling apart the organization um, of, of an entire unit. Now, uh, to combat this, they, uh, the armies at the time came up with various ideas of how to protect themselves, including forming massive squares. This is something that very famously happens at Waterloo. They form huge squares because a horse, despite... Um, you know, how powerful it is um, and how easily it could break through. They just will not... Oh, here you go. Here's a square foreman. Square, okay. Yeah, yeah. They, they will not charge a solid wall of people. Interesting. So, 
Yeah. And so you do find, like, you've got the two examples here on the left. You've got the square here, which was meant to defend against cavalry, but was incredibly uh, vulnerable to artillery fire because you can't easily move as this square, you know. <laughs> you know, you'd all have to do it synchronized, walking slightly different directions. Mm -hmm. um, and then you've got the guys on the right and your usual lines of fire who, um, you know, were were less vulnerable to cannon fire because if a shot went through, it might only take out one small line of people rather than going through two lines of people. Um, but then, yeah, if the horse has got around or to the side of you, that you were in trouble, basically. Right. Um, and so they, they even when they weren't in the squares, they could stop the cavalry sometimes. But if people started to run, if the line started to break down, or if the horses got behind or beside you, then you're in serious trouble. And so that's why they came up with these squares. Wow. So when did this idea of the square, is that something that people have, that armies knew about for, you know, a thousand years, or is it something that just kind of, it was more recent of a discovery? That's a, that's an interesting question. I, I remember watching a documentary um, about, about the battle and it was saying that the square was this sort of modern invention of the last 200 years, you know, around, hmm. Uh, Waterloo, but 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 you know, I I remember this famous battle where where um it was one of Julius Caesar's uh, allies who ends up dying. I've forgotten his name, Crassus. He forms a square when he's fighting in Parthia, which is in uh, the Middle East, uh, around sort of modern day Iraq and southern Turkey. Um, and he is under fire for like three days straight, just walking trying to walk in an organized fashion as a big square to protect wow, himself. Oh my gosh. Yeah. That's, that's, yeah. I mean, yeah, I can't imagine how difficult that must've been. And we do have a comment. Barbara says it must've taken a lot of guts to stand in a square as a ton of horses charge at you. Uh, I would, I would think right. so too. Uh, and then what are we looking at? Right. We're you're marching. Is this a battery? Is that what we're attacking? Yeah. Right? yeah trying so to take out the artillery. Thing. Exactly. Yeah. So they're trying to dislodge the artillery there. Um, that was another use of the um, horses as well, mm -hmm. what they were particularly good for. You know, if an artillery battery was sort of left by itself because, uh, you know, the infantry had to go deal with a problem or pressure being put on somewhere else, if the space was left too open, it was very common for Napoleon especially to plug that gap that he had been attacking with horses, mm -hmm. uh, with the cavalry, who, you know, would just completely decimate and often steal the cannons as well oh, and, wow. take them, and take them back to the other yeah. side. I would have um, liked to have done that, but I've lost kind of all my cavalry. So, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So how are things going on the battle here? He's in, he's in trouble. Well, I have taken the river. Oh, well, that's okay. good. Yeah. But you lost your cavalry <laughs> and the cannons back here. Okay. So it's not great. I'm sure I could do better, but right. And so Tristan, the way you're controlling it basically is, is you have to click on each unit and kind of tell them like where to go where and where to move and, and yeah, where to move. And then you have, I guess each unit has morale. You can yes. kind of see that. I think the, the bar here is indicating their morale. Right. So if they get flanked, that drops quickly. Oops. They're, they're running. And away flank, right flank now. just basically means that the other side has gotten out around the sides is coming kind of towards the sides of, of the unit. Right. Kind of, getting around them and behind them. And that's like a bad situation, right? Yeah. Yeah. That's not good. <laughs> yeah. That, that is a, a sort of F minus. In yeah, right. Of, yeah. Right. It's no good. Um, and then, you know, right. So the, the way this game works is, you know, you're just kind of clicking and telling people what to do. Henry, how did they, how did they organize and communicate these massive battlefields uh, during this time period? Cause I imagine that must've been very difficult to do. Oh, definitely. You know, when, what it's funny, the question you said, uh, or the comment you, you guys said earlier about the sort of the idea of the Napoleonic battle being this big open area, you know, that did lend itself to communication. And so sometimes it was better to be there. If you had an absolutely humongous army, it was a good idea to be in an open area or moderately open so that you could see flag signals or hear drum signals that were going on. Mm. Um, or bugles, you know, trumpets playing that would uh, indicate what you were supposed to do. Wow. Um, but especially at Waterloo and at Ligny, I mean, looking at this sort of site where you can't really see what's going on and your army is sort of spread out, the word is spread by um, messengers, often on horseback, go, going between the lines, um, you know, heading out from 
Napoleon to his marshals who are controlling each little division of men. And I imagine, you know, because of the complexity of just, you know, even just trying to communicate on what to do and knowing what each signal means. I mean, I assume that this was all pretty much a professional, uh, you know, armed forces. This was not volunteers or militia. What was, what was that? Was that correct? Or, or was it, it kind of a mix? It was a real kind of mix. So at this time, the, the, this campaign, what's known as the Waterloo campaign, which includes Ligny that we're looking at now, is like the first time in Napoleon's military history as the Emperor of France that he has not had a fully professional grilled army. Mm. Um, he has had to basically levy soldiers. He's had to force people to come and fight for him. Um, and, you know, they're not, they're not as well trained. There's still a core army of professionals, some of the most feared troops in, in Europe at the time, the Imperial Guards, who were chosen for being um, over six foot and having huge mustaches oh, wow. and muscly legs as well. Mm -hmm. uh, those were the free, the free tick boxes. We've got old um, guard and young guard. Yeah, the old guard and the young guard. So the young, so when I mentioned um, Plassenoir earlier, that was the young guards doing. They managed to hold the line for quite a while. Um, the English side is interesting. So they were all very heavily trained, but they all had... Um, uh, they had like an interesting level of reliability. They, they, they sort of just divided them by merit and effect. there's all these commentaries made by some of the generals, one of whom is a guy called Pickford who dies at Waterloo, basically saying, God, I've like, my army is just like made up of thieves and, wow. and like not cool people. Basically, mm -hmm. I'm not sure if I can swear on this, but you're basically just yeah. cool. Yeah, you do whatever you want. Yeah. 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 He basically called, yeah. called them bastards and said, they were, <laughs> like, like, you know, it, it was just like, I've got these scoundrels to command, uh -huh. you know. Um, and yeah, there's this amazing version of Waterloo that's been put to film in 19, in 1970 by a, a Soviet director, which you can see for free on, on YouTube. Oh yeah, uh, we'll definitely put a link to that up uh, when, whenever because we'll put this video up on our YouTube channel, so we'll, we'll mm -hmm. put links in the description for that. Amazing, yeah, that'd be, that'd be wicked. Um, uh, yeah, the um, the the film is like one of the last times you see uh, huge amounts of people being gathered instead of CGI, right? Or, yeah, or yeah. practical effects, and it is absolutely crazy. Like, yeah. the film wasn't particularly well reviewed, but it's like it's like two whole battalions of the Soviet army or something ridiculous like that. Wow. wow. Um, yeah. The, if you have a look at the clips, it's absolutely insane. And they, and they bulldozed a part of Ukraine, uh, this field in Ukraine to make it look like the battlefield um, wow. of Waterloo, you know, mile by mile. And um, yeah, yeah, it's it absolutely crazy. I'd recommend anyone. Yeah, definitely. We'll, we'll check that out. And so we've, we've got about, we're, we only got like 10 minutes left. So I just wanted to ask you a couple more things. I definitely want to talk a little bit more I about Waterloo. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Go for it. I've seen some pretty amazing stuff with battlefield archaeology and using technology like such as LIDAR, GPR. Uh, do you know of anything like that uh, with uh, being done at Waterloo or anything like that? So, yeah. So we, we this year, are so we're, we're not um, having access to anything like LIDAR just yet, but that would be absolutely incredible. Mm -hmm. But we have been doing um, geophysical surveys to help identify where we should dig and looking for anomalies that will help better decide where we go in the following years. But what is particularly exciting about what we're doing this year is we're doing a big GIS survey. So that's ground information surveys, I think. Uh, and that is, uh, no, ground information systems. I don't know. So someone will put in a, a, a comment and say, and help me out there. But um, we're doing... I think geographic information systems, I think, is what we, at least in the US, I think right. is what we, we call it. Okay, there you go. Um, so we're doing the biggest one of those that has been done in Europe for an archaeological dig ever. Wow. Um, and we are going to be mapping the entire battlefield, which is about five miles across. Um, oh, God, I, miles, I'm speaking in Imperial. <laughs> <laughs> what, 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 I don't know what that is in kilometers, but it's... Yeah, it's, yeah. 
it's close to about maybe seven or eight kilometers, maybe. That would That's be incredible. Point. Yeah. I mean, I think, and Tristan mentioned LIDAR. So LIDAR is basically like laser shot from, now they're doing it with drones, but yeah. it can, it's great because it can uh, penetrate through tree canopy and give you a really great idea of the top of the topography. So you can see the outlines of fortifications or, or, you know, whatever, whatever sort of earthwork was put up, you can see that really clearly. And GPR is ground penetrating radar. And that uses radar signals to basically see if there might be a disturbance under the ground, which may mean that there's archeological uh, evidence at that yeah, site. It's, it, it's an amazing method. And the, the sort of biggest success of those, um, uh, of those ways of doing, using radar and non-intrusive archeology, span as it's called, mm -hmm. is, yeah. is one called Angkor Wat, which is in Thailand, where they basically uncovered an absolutely humongous complex of religious structures. It's basically, to, it's like an underground city mm -hmm. that they now ex excavated and you can go and visit it. But I would, uh, you know, definitely give it a Google. It's absolutely incredible how they uncovered it. Yeah. And so can you, can you tell us just, you know, kind of, we have, like I said, about 10 minutes left. What, what, what was the outcome at, at the, this particular battle, Ligny and, and, and the outcome of Waterloo? Sure. So, um, Ligny, the French win, or rather they buy time. So Blücher uh, and his Prussians are applying pressure on the French and Napoleon musters his forces to push the Prussians to the east and to push them, more importantly, away from the British and the Dutch and the Belgian forces that are converging near Brussels. So he is buying himself time uh, so that he can turn his attention to the British and their allies to then defeat them and therefore, and then maybe turn back around and defeat the Prussians, you know, decisively. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately for him, it doesn't go that way. He commits one third of his army to chase Blücher and his Prussians after they are driven from the field at Ligny. And um, he's, uh, his marshal, whose name I, I can't remember, is, for, is forced to basically follow Blücher and apply pressure on him so that he cannot turn back around to the West to meet up with the British. Um, and so he takes the remaining two thirds of his army to attack the British. And because of that numerical difference, he has a hard time defeating Wellington, um, and the the battle basically comes to an end, and the French line falls apart because Blücher manages to break free of this other third of the French army that's on his tail and get to Waterloo in time to support Wellington, which flanks Napoleon's army on the right um, and basically just makes the position completely um, in, untenable. And so they flee from the field, it's in complete disarray, and Napoleon surrenders himself a few days later and is exiled to the island of St. Helena, which is in the South Atlantic, where he lives out his days under the supervision of the, uh, the local governor there, who's a sort of British empire. Um, I, I, I don't know the terminology, you know, just like a sort of regional... Sure person you know so this is the second time he's exiled mm -hmm. second, it is yeah, yeah. It, it, you know, it's fascinating to me that you know they they let him live you know he he had caused all this destruction and mm -hmm. it's interesting is, was it just because he was still a popular figure and was that just in terms of the the agreement for him to uh stop fighting i i think it for them it's a bad precedent that killing uh, a head of state would right. resolve the issues. But also, to make things more complicated, um, Napoleon was sort of deeply embedded in the royal lineages of mm -hmm. Europe. So his wife was the princess of Austria. Um, so, you know, you would be killing a, uh, a um, very close family member of the sure. Austrian uh, leader. And his son, who will, would be known as Napoleon II, um, uh, although I, I don't know too much about him, so don't, don't quiz me on that. But he, he, he ends up basically living in Vienna for a long time. And so I think it was sort of if they treated him like a common criminal and, and executed him, it would somehow set a precedent for that behavior being uh, or that treatment being dished out on other monarchs. Sure, and also yeah. the fact that he technically was a monarch 
but not really. Mm-hmm. He was an emperor, which they sort of drew some sort of difference between. Um, that if they did that, it would, you know, it, it would somehow disintegrate the image of untouchable monarchies around Europe. Uh, yeah, yeah. I guess that that makes more sense to me. Um, and so, can you can you tell us, like, for people that want to learn more about Waterloo and Covered, where where can they go to get more information, and how can they help support you all? Sure. So we've we've got a wonderful website at www.waterlooncovered.com, um, where we have loads of resources and fact files, videos uh, from our veterans and from our excavations. Um, and if you search Waterloo Uncovered into YouTube or Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn, any any site of your choosing, we post all of our resources there. Um, we rely almost entirely on donations for our ability to carry out these excavations um, and to support the veterans that are uncovering the, this history and helping tell the story of these battles. And so um, if anyone can... Uh, spare a donation we also have a link on our website absolutely yeah and i'll put the links to the website and to you you do have an awesome i uh, looked at some of the the videos you had on your youtube channel i'll put all that up on um when we put this up when we upload this video to our youtube channel so people can easily find that information down in the description of uh, of that video once it's up uh, but yeah i mean it's such an amazing um uh, obviously the, the battlefield, uh, Barbara did mention, uh, she said it's a huge battlefield. I imagine Waterloo was, was as well. Uh, and it's just, it's a fantastic, uh, program that you are running, um, with, and then, and when did you say that you all started Waterloo and covered? So it started in 2015 and 2015. back then we, had, we only had the one, uh, the one program, which is the excavation. And now we still do the excavation every year. Uh, but this year we are running four other programs, including an arts program, a finds program. So, wow. you know, treating the objects, a virtual program and a teaching program uh, uh, called Battlefields Uncovered, which um, helps veterans learn about battlefield archaeology, but also to gain academic credits um, as well. For That's a great. Year future study. Yeah. And then, um, I, I know obviously, you know, a lot of veterans are working with you all volunteering to excavate. What about opportunities for, um, archeology span students, maybe in mm. grad programs? Do you work with them at all? Uh, we do work alongside them. So the university, we are working with a university team with that, uh, geographical information systems survey i think i got that right that time. Yeah, I think that's um, right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That they are working with us. Um, uh, the, na- the name of the university, I, I can't uh, remember, but they're, they're doing that uh, alongside us. That's um, the Probably the easiest way to work alongside us is to uh, work with um, LP Archaeology, who are the people who manage the excavation for us and take care of the sort of logistics. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I, do, I don't actually know if they have any... Um, ways for people to get involved with this this year's excavation at least but you you know um watch this space uh in the next uh years we may have room for volunteers to help us out with various different activities that the charity does um alongside the excavation like our treatment of fines and conservation yeah, absolutely. And I mean, it's always great to see I mean, I think you are doing such a great job with community archaeology and public archaeology. And so, uh, yeah, and then doing this even, we really appreciate you coming on and taking the time to talk to us about uh, this, this incredible, uh, incredible program that you all run and, and this massive battle that took place that was really a watershed moment in certainly European history, but I would say probably in even world history. Um, certainly. For everyone. Yeah, so yeah. But yeah, I want to, again, thank Henry and uh, Waterloo Uncovered for, for taking the time to come in on Archaeology Arcade. Tristan, do you have anything else to add? Did I leave anything out? No, I think you covered it really well. Yeah. And how is your army faring? Are you? <laughs> it looks uh, like you're getting pushed back across the bridge again. They decided they wanted to go for Napoleon, and I, so I'm fighting that right now. But we're going to assume that I do really, really well. <laughs> yeah best of luck yeah, yeah, yeah it's, it's, <laughs> oh no here comes uh, the cavalry we, we all we all know how this ends now so I mean, maybe yeah. maybe he should just leave i don't know yeah but uh but yeah so i will put this video up on our youtube channel people can check out this episode of archaeology arcade uh by just going to youtube and 
typing in Florida Public Archaeology Network. We have lots of content on there. Um, obviously, uh, like I mentioned, I'll put all those links to what Henry mentioned down in the description below. Uh, we don't have any more archaeology arcades scheduled just yet, but the best way to keep up with that information is just uh, follow us on um, social media. So Facebook, uh, Instagram, we have a TikTok account. So Twitch. if any Twitch, yeah, we have a Twitch, obviously. So if you want to follow, if you follow us on Twitch, um, then whenever we do go live, you'll get that notification. So that's a good way to keep up with uh, when we have our next our next episode. So I want to thank everybody who took the time to join us today, uh, live streaming and all the comments on stream chat. We appreciate you all. We appreciate your support and we will see you next time. Bye.